good morning. That was all the French for the time being because, well, this session will be in English. Uh, I'm with uh, Joseph Ashbarer, the Director General of the European Space Agency. And I have a feeling of déjà vu because, well, last year, at about the same time in the year, we were already discussing this. It means uh, you, you had just been appointed uh, Director General. Uh, you had been very active uh, completing the negotiation with the uh, European Commission for the uh, uh, Financial Framework Partnership Agreement, and you had already presented the uh, Agenda 2025 for all the projects you had for, for your mandate. So let's start quick. And uh, what has changed in one year? <laughs> what has changed in one year? Um, actually, it sounds like much more than a year because I've aged certainly two or three years in, in, uh, in this one year. No, but what has changed? I, I think what uh, certainly um, I tried to, and I'm not sure whether it succeeded or not, but uh, to, to raise the profile of uh, space in Europe, or at least the, the awareness that uh, Europe needs to do more in space. Um, I think Europe is excellent in space. We have a lot of uh, fantastic projects and activities, but it's also clear that if we are not accelerating, and uh, that means uh, uh, reinforcing our investments, our activities in space, we will lose out because it is happening around us. Uh, uh, we see uh, in the US, uh, we see in China, we see uh, in the commercial sector, an extremely fast uh, growth, an extremely fast uh, race. Some people call it the second, uh, the next space race in which we are. And uh, Europe has no choice than to really participate in this because we have a lot, of, a lot to offer. And I, I hope that this uh, awareness, which of course was there before, but uh, this awareness also through Agenda 25 was reinforced and brought, I would say, in front of people's eyes, a bit like a mirror uh, where you, you see uh, the reality of the world in front of you and uh, really uh, hopefully wake up and, uh, and realize that uh, you need to accelerate. So I, I think you had some uh, slides to present to us. Yeah, I have a couple of slides. I would probably go faster through the slides. I see in the audience, I think many of you are familiar with the topics, but uh, probably then spend a bit more time on discussion. So if we could show the slides, here they are. First one, uh, okay, this is not, does not need any explanation, just to recall what ESA is doing and uh, uh, what the various elements are. Uh, next one, and this I think is a very important one, uh, to really just to remember everyone the role of uh, France in space, uh, in the world, but also in ESA. Uh, France is the number one investor in ESA, uh, is, uh, has been at the origin of creating ESA, but also has a, a huge number of, uh, of achievements uh, through ESA programs, uh, sometimes complemented through national activities. And this is something that is, uh, is, is really nice to, to see, but also to, I think we should uh, use this occasion here, especially organized here in this uh, Paris Air Forum, to recall that uh, what the space power France is and, uh, and what we are building. So we're not building on zero. Sometimes people say that uh, we need to catch up, we need to do much better. Yes, we need to, but uh, we are starting from a pretty good point, and especially here in France, I think this is something I really would like to recall. Not to mention, of course, uh, Thomas Pesquet, who is uh, a hero, uh, not only in France, but in Nice and many other countries and I think this really helps also creating some of the awareness. This is um, uh, a figure which uh, you probably have seen or you know at least the basics of it. It shows the budget evolution, uh, NASA on the top, um, ESA on the bottom. Uh, there's two lines for ESA. One is the uh, dotted line and the, the solid line. The dotted line is the one of ESA member states funding and the solid line is uh, including the contributions of the Commission and UMITSAT in particular, other third parties. Uh, so you see an increased trend, but also you see that the budget, of course, of NASA, for example, is much, much higher. It's about three times higher. If you do not include the defense part, if you include the defense part, it's probably another three times higher, so a factor of six. Uh, but also, and the yellow curve, I think, is the interesting part, the commercial sector that really picks up. And uh, last year, for the first time, the investment from the commercial sector uh, is higher than the budget of ESA. And I think this is uh, interesting. I'm very happy about this, uh, just don't misunderstand. But it's a reality, meaning that ESA has to really change uh, its gear, has to work differently in order to really uh, deal with this new situation and be a good partner, a very relevant partner uh, in this overall context. 
This slide is uh, a bit of a recalling of Agenda 25. I don't need to say on uh, what is on the right hand side, on the, so on the left hand side. On the right hand side, uh, it shows a few strengths and also weaknesses of, of uh, Europe in space. Certainly, Europe has uh, world leadership in, in a number of domains. You know them in Earth observation, in geostationary telecommunication, navigation. We have the most uh, precise signal we are producing uh, with uh, Galileo but also in space science, uh, we are producing with our satellites and instruments some of the world's uh, highest numbers of uh, peer-reviewed journals. That means science is extremely high, and of course the satellites that uh, measure that is, uh, these are of top quality. And then on the minus, you see some of the elements where we have fallen behind, and I think we have to recognize this if you want to do an honest assessment. Uh, in launches up to about 10 years or seven, eight years ago, we had world leadership, and today I don't need to explain the situation. We have to catch up. But also in other domains, uh, secure connectivity, uh, of course, well known here. Broadband internet is not, uh, we do not have anything in, uh, in Europe at this point of time, and again, uh, Europe, uh, this is happening outside, and Europe needs to position itself how we do that. And uh, why do I show that? Um, of course, on one side, we have excellence to offer, really some of the best uh, engineers and engineering capability with the industry doing an incredibly good job. Uh, on the other side, uh, there are domains where especially the commercial sector also steps in, and there Europe has to catch up uh, very, very clearly. Yeah, security. Uh, this was also addressed just uh, a few minutes ago by Thierry Breton uh, downstairs in the opening speech. Uh, a big uh, topic. Uh, big question, of course, is uh, in this new situation, what do we do in Europe collectively in space and security? Uh, as you know very well, ESA is uh, mostly, not exclusively, but mostly working in, uh, in the civilian domain with uh, some exceptions, the PRS signal being one of them, but also a number of others, where we are working in the security domain, but it's certainly negligible uh, and not something that uh, is, uh, is uh, existing and well established today. The question is, especially with the war in Ukraine, what does Europe want medium to long term on space and security? Of course, we have very strong national capability, and this is excellent, but uh, at European level, we have nothing comparable. And I think this is something, a question that I would like to ask uh, decision makers. What do you want? What do you want uh, in general, and uh, what do you want from ESA? How should ESA orient itself, or what should ESA do? Then uh, another point, and this is one of the elements you said, what has changed? I think. Sorry, the accelerators uh, and inspirators you see on this slide here is certainly something that has uh, been created over the last uh, year. Uh, and uh, I don't uh, need to explain the content because this is you are very familiar with it. But this is for me a new way of uh, raising major future, uh, call it flagship initiatives, uh, major big programs, uh, probably of the size of Copernicus and Galileo. Uh, we are at a very early phase today, at the uh, at day one of Copernicus. I remember it myself uh, pretty well, uh, where I, people did not believe in it, and people thought these are dreams, and these are concepts, and these are empty things will, which will never happen. Uh, but uh, I, I firmly believe that those topics we are addressing here with these accelerators, which are the green future, rapid and resilient response, uh, protecting our assets in space, uh, satellites, uh, and astronauts, is something that needs to develop a large scale, and there we have got huge uh, support politically from our member states, uh, uh, at the Space Summit, uh, uh, at uh, Matosinos, uh, and I think this is something that uh, where people do not yet uh, uh, expect or um, understand, uh, or uh, I would say imagine uh, what uh, this, uh, uh, in which direction this evolution goes. We have small seed funding for senior ministerial, but the majority should be building blocks coming from other sources. Uh, I've mentioned uh, Toulouse, um, I've, you have all been there uh, and you have all seen it. I think this was a very important milestone, first time ever that the Space Summit was organized in Europe of the, at this level, including uh, Head of State, uh, Mr. Macron, giving an incredibly strong speech. Uh, and this, um, I think, is important. It was, by the way, mentioned uh, in Agenda 25 as one element that we should achieve, and I'm very happy it took place, but also it was extremely successful. And as you know, we are planning for a second Space Summit at the end of next year. What is coming up next? Of course, our ministerial at the end of this year is uh, the big uh, highlight always of ESA. A space summit, uh, um, we had one and we are preparing for the next one to address uh, human exploration as a, a major theme. And talking of the space, uh, sorry, of the ministerial conference, of course, we are in the midst of putting a very 
ambitious uh, package together. Um, I hope um, uh, it is more ambitious than the one of uh, 2019, which was already the highest subscriptions ever we got in, uh, in space for Europe. I know the circumstances are challenging, but on the other side, I think especially because we are in such challenging circumstances uh, uh, with uh, security concerns, uh, the climate crisis still there, many other domains from a commercialization of space point of view, for example, still being extremely needed, and uh, that, that's why I'm really pleased leading with all the, the member states and the decision makers to have a very, very strong ministerial because this is what Europe needs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, th there is an elephant in the room that uh, should be evacuated right now. Uh, one of the big changes since last year is that we are, we are at war some, in some ways. Uh, there's war at our, at our borders. Uh, and there are consequences for the space program how do you manage it? Uh, what are the consequences? Uh, well, now that we have three months uh, dealing with the topic. Yeah. No, that's a, that is, of course, uh, um, something that uh, was a big wake-up call, I think, for many of us, uh, geopolitically, obviously, but also in space. Uh, and there are two aspects to it. One is uh, the immediate actions you, you need to do in order to adapt to the current situation. And there we have taken extremely fast decisions with the member states, uh, what to do with projects where Russia was involved, and I say was involved because we have now uh, separated them. ExoMars, uh, Soyuz from Kourou, you know perfectly well that there was uh, Russia uh, withdrawing its, uh, its engineers, uh, but also on Luna we have um, discontinued the, the cooperation and several other things. So there are the immediate impacts in terms of um, satellites, uh, uh, instruments, and, and in this particular case of ExoMars, uh, uh, the Rosalind Franklin uh, lander to be brought to Mars. And this is uh, programmatic or program decisions which we had to take. And this was, uh, I have to say, unanimously, very clearly supported by all the member states. No, not much discussion what needs to be done. It had to be done, and we have been extremely fast in reacting to that. And there we are now, of course, implementing the consequences of it. Uh, it is uh, painful, I have to say, uh, because uh, from an engineering and uh, also financial point of view, it costs Europe uh, uh, a lot uh, to reorient ExoMars, for example, uh, and to see a way forward. Uh, the engineers in my house who have been working on the project for 15 years, I can tell you we had uh, quite a few discussions uh, to keep them motivated and uh, to deal with the situation because they were all working for 15 years to get uh, everything ready uh, for the launch pad. Uh, we have been technically ready. Uh, we could have launched, uh, we could launch in uh, September. Uh, but, uh, of course, having all this on hold and industry obviously being at the core of it uh, is, a, is, a big, uh, is a big shock. Uh, not to talk about the science, uh, the scientists waiting for the samples uh, on uh, Mars with the drill that uh, uh, goes into the surface um, and uh, see what, what happens there underground. Of course, this is, uh, is a huge impact uh, from many perspectives. So on, on, this, on this part, of course, we need to deal with it. Uh, we are finding a solution for ExoMars. Um, right now, uh, we are in discussion with uh, NASA in particular, what, uh, how they could uh, support it, and of course, European partners. So this is ongoing, and I expect decisions uh, uh, to be prepared for July uh, before the summer break, and then put them into the ministerial package. But there's a much bigger um, impact of it, and this has to do with security. I mentioned it before. So the question suddenly appears on the table, what and how do we address security? And also, the geopolitical situation, uh, the, unfortunately, I have to say, um, what is the result of the war is that um, the world is dividing into poles. One pole uh, driven by the US, another pole probably driven by the eastern partners, China, uh, together with Russia. Uh, and this uh, polarization has intensified uh, very clearly, uh, meaning that the cooperation internationally and Europe and especially ESA, we have been the agency with the, I would say, the largest number of uh, cooperations uh, with, uh, with almost everyone um, and with many agreements in place. Uh, I've asked my people recently, we have more than 100 cooperation agreements from very big uh, ones to very small ones. And of course, this needs to be reviewed. Of course, some of them continue, some of them intensify. We still will be the ones that probably are in the midst uh, geographically and want to cooperate with many, but in some segments it may be more difficult. So I think this geopolitical polarization is certainly something we see with its pros and cons. Uh, the cons may be that uh, uh, some of the 
uh, cooperation and partnerships may not materialize or not be so easy. The pro may be that, uh, um, especially with uh, in the cooperation with NASA, this may intensify. And I do see this very clearly, that NASA has been uh, very forthcoming, uh, also in helping us uh, uh, to come out of uh, some of the consequences uh, of the cooperation with Russia, and ExoMars in particular, uh, have been very supportive and very strong in uh, helping us finding ways forward. Of course, at the end, Europe needs its independent, autonomous solution, uh, but independence or more autonomy does not mean we do everything ourselves. We do it as a strong partner with others. Well, for, for ExoMars, uh, if we can recall, we went with the Russians because the uh, Americans left us in the middle of the way. So uh, it's kind of uh, turning around this, uh, this thing. Uh, regarding the, uh, the space station, uh, what, is, uh, what is... Well, we've, we've heard what, say, what the Russians say, we heard what the uh, Americans say regarding the uh, uh, continuation of the ISS. So what do the Europeans say for that? Yeah, what is Europe saying? Of course, something that uh, has been very uh, uh, hotly and deeply debated, you can imagine. But uh, looking at all, I would say the, the, sur the messages that you, you hear and see on the surface, you have to really look a bit deeper what you really want and what uh, our member states really want. Let me recall, though, that uh, um, uh, some of the Corporations we have built up are uh, originating after the, co the, the Cold War or even during the Cold War, where there was a huge uh, tendency to, um, to embrace Russia uh, after the fall of the Iron Curtain in particular and therefore establish cooperation, and the space station, of course, being the, the best of those examples. But what we do and, um, um, uh, on our side, uh, we are committed uh, to the continuation of the space station. Uh, we are making plans, uh, uh, of course, the Decisions have yet to be made by the member states uh, through the ministerial conference, but we are preparing proposals to, uh, to keep running on the space station until 2030 uh, with uh, all its investments that are necessary, astronaut programs uh, that are uh, lined up in order to do that. So for us, we uh, proceed nominally uh, under the circumstances as they are. And I have to say that um, the space station is probably the the only exception uh, where the cooperation between uh, um, Russia and the West is uh, still very intact. Actually, it works nominally with really no issues uh, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, all the operations of the space station, uh, uh, the life on the, on the station itself, among the astronauts, the experiments, uh, the maintenance of the station, all this is very nominal and I'm very happy about that. Well, just to finish with this topic of the war, uh, it happened just after the Toulouse summit and let's say, a little eclipsed it. Uh, what was secured in Toulouse, actually? What was secured in Toulouse? I think, um, um, on one side, it was quite unique to see this strength and the force of the EU and ESA member states being assembled there and giving, I would say, two very clear messages. One was that the Commission, or the EU and ESA, need to closely work together. The Commission, uh, uh, Commissioner Breton, um, has tabled uh, secure connectivity, has announced that the regulation uh, uh, will be initiated and will be negotiated, which is happening right now, plus uh, preparing a white paper on STM, on space traffic management. So this is on the Commission side. On the ESA side, we have complementary and really complementary activities we, we proposed. Uh, I mentioned the uh, three accelerators and two inspirators, and they really go hand in hand. Let me take the accelerator on uh, rapid and resilient crisis response. This is actually the counterpart to secure connectivity, because secure connectivity delivers the connections, that means the communications part, and uh, the rapid and resilient uh, response uh, set up once, of course, uh, in place and, uh, and working, will provide the content. So you really have these two uh, elements playing extremely well together, where one needs the other in order to really uh, be um, uh, fruitful in, in terms of its implementation. Uh, similar on Protect and STM, there we have worked since Toulouse on a uh, on a concept how the Commission and ESA can align their activities to our accelerator preparation with the STM uh, activity on the side of the Commission. I'm not going into detail because this is, uh, um, uh, is being uh, developed right now, but I can say that uh, we are in a very good way uh, of having a clear understanding of how we work together. Uh, and of course, I don't need to mention Green Future, which is, uh, uh, I think, uh, very much in support of uh, EU priorities. The other thing that came out of uh, of uh, Toulouse, apart from the EU-ESA cooperation, which I, I, th I see as a symbol of being really reinforced, 
<coughs> is the, the need to accelerate uh, space in Europe, acceleration throughout the uh, different domains, but especially on human exploration. And there, as you know, uh, we got the mandate, I got the mandate uh, uh, as ESA to set up a high-level advisory group uh, to reflect on the options of uh, what it means to um, to invest or not invest on human exploration, what are the cost implications, what are the options, uh, what the, to really prepare decisions uh, for, uh, for decision makers uh, uh, at the summit uh, at the end of next year. And uh, the interesting proposal which uh, we made there is that this high-level group will not be space people. This will be people from society, uh, well-known economists, historians, uh, artists, people of science, uh, uh, journalists, uh, people who really have, uh, uh, I would say, a good understanding of the needs of, of people, of society, uh, and can debate this topic uh, um, not uh, through the lenses of, uh, of space, space experts, but really independently with uh, uh, having the needs of society as a top priority. And I really look forward to this uh, to this uh, group. Uh, I don't want to mention the names yet because we are at th these days uh, confirming uh, the names of this group. But it will be once uh, uh, they will be known, you will see that they are very uh, interesting uh, representative of society and I really look forward to this debate because this for me is a very important debate to have. Well, uh, in uh, five months from now we'll be in the final preparation for the ministerial. Uh, I guess that you're already working out on this. Uh, can you tease us uh, what will be presented and uh, will there be any surprises? Will there be surprises? There will certainly be new programs, uh, new activities that, are, um, that we will start. Um, and certainly some of it will have to do with the moon. Uh, I hope that uh, the cooperation with NASA, in fact, um, very happy to say that uh, next week uh, we have an ESA Council and the Administrator of NASA, Bill Nelson, uh, will come to speak to the ESA Member States. Uh, uh, and this will be a very important moment for the ESA Member States to hear firsthand of what NASA, uh, how NASA sees the cooperation uh, on especially the space station, uh, the mission to the Moon and uh, to Mars in particular. Uh, we are preparing a number of proposals along this line, so I think this, w this is extremely important. I don't want to preempt any of these discussions, of course, next week. There will be a press uh, uh, event, by the way, together with uh, Bill Nelson and uh, myself and the chair of ESA Council. Um, but, so this is certainly uh, something that, that is in the preparation and will be very important. Of course, other topics like uh, secure connectivity. Uh, we will propose a package uh, to support uh, the activities of uh, the initiative uh, announced by Mr. Breton. Uh, of course, in climate and earth observation, we have a huge package uh, put together with new missions. Uh, uh, I, mean, I pick out one uh, just uh, to highlight uh, uh, an example, which is AELOS. AELOS-1 uh, has been an incredible mission where Europe has shown its excellence technically, uh, building something that nobody else has done in the world, um, using uh, 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 building a, an instrument which has uh, a UV LiDAR, uh, which normally in vacuum does not work. Uh, we had many problems ourselves. I have to say that uh, it costed us a lot of extra time. I was at this time responsible for the mission. Um, a bit of extra money, but in terms of extra time, it, uh, the 10 years extra development, I have to say, have been worth it because we have just not given up. We have done the impossible. Uh, and uh, now the user community, uh, that means ECMWF, the National Met Services, are incredibly happy with this data. It was the number one data they really wanted to have. Uh, uh, that means wind information in cloud for atmosphere. It has improved the weather forecast m uh, models uh, tremendously, and we will propose a successor mission, so ILOS 2, uh, which will uh, continue this, uh, these measurements uh, of ILOS 1, which is still in orbit and, and function well. By the way, the mission was meant to work for three years, has exceeded its lifetime. Nobody believed that this will happen or is possible. I have to say that Europe can really be proud, and I see some of the industry representatives here, what has happened together. All of us is something that that uh, is unique, uh, nobody else has it in the world, and uh, this shows that Europe is excellent, uh, but we have to put our act together, and we have to keep investing in order to do that, and the ministerial is the moment to do so. Oh, okay, for the <coughs> last, uh, my last uh, question, uh, there is interference, <laughs> jamming. Um, these days, what is in everybody's mind is inflation and space has the bad reputation of being not earned but uh, being 
expensive. Uh, will this, uh, is this something that we should worry about before the ministerial? Yes, we should worry, um, and this is actually a problem we, 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 are, we are tackling with right now. Uh, the inflation uh, has there are two aspects uh, how, how this needs to be tackled. One is uh, space programs, as you know, are programs that run over, say, 10 years or sometimes more. That means uh, programs that have uh, started five years ago uh, and now through inflation may, may face difficulties in terms of cost or in terms of uh, the costs that are incurred because some of the components or some of the work has just become much more expensive. And this needs to be dealt with and we are discussing with industry what could be a clever way of doing it. And that's the difficult part. The easier, I'm not saying it's easy, but the easier part is for new programs, how can we buffer the inflation in the future? Uh, there, of course, you can make estimates uh, what is the inflation planned for next year and the year after and the year after. And there we take the figures of the European Central Bank uh, as the guidance. Uh, they are publishing uh, inflation figures uh, for the years uh, to come. And we will adapt or we will um, uh, put this possibility to adjust for this inflation into the proposals for the new programs that are uh, up and uh, uh, coming in the future. Uh, the more dif difficult ones is really the one, how do we deal with the current running projects uh, when inflation, uh, it's not only inflation, it's also cost increases because of uh, materials and, uh, and other increases, uh, energy prices that happened. Um, and uh, how do we handle those parts? And there we, uh, we have yet to work on a solution. We do not have yet it on the table, but this is something we, we look into it. Uh, quite quite significantly. Well, we have a few minutes left, so I wondered if Peter or the rest of the audience had any question. <coughs> the marshmallow question. The, 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 the mic is coming. So, Joseph, you talked about the crystallization of the idea of two poles being formed in the world. It didn't start with Ukraine, but there has been a sort of a, more of a clarification of what that might mean. Um, so never mind Russia for the moment, but China. Uh, the U.S. has had for over a decade now a very strict relationship with China, which means we don't even want to talk to you on space which is too bad, but it achieves a policy objective in the United States. Is there anything like that kind of policy objective that you see coming in Europe? ESA has several programs with China, not a whole lot, but some. Uh, only because you mentioned it, I'd like, if, if, if there's any evolution to the thinking, it might be useful. No, thanks, uh, Peter. You, you said before the meeting, the meeting will be marshmallows and honey, so I think you are, you're going into the juice of it. Uh, no. For the moment, I mean, we have a, f a number of running programs, uh, as you know, so they will certainly continue. There's no need to change uh, anything. Uh, but I also see uh, the situation, the development with China a bit in a wait and see uh, mode, if I may say, uh, because I think I would like to, or European member states, I should say, uh, would like to see how the geopolitical situation stabilizes or develops uh, probably in a couple of uh, months. Uh, uh, and I think this is certainly very important to, to see what, uh, how these developments go. Um, and um, as you know perfectly well, um, as ESA, we need to align and we align our priorities uh, based on the member states' uh, priorities they express in themselves or at EU level or whatever level they have. And certainly ESA uh, is, uh, is very much uh, um, driven also by the member state priorities. So I would say overall no change, uh, but a bit in a wait and see situation, see how the global situation develops and see whether, what that means eventually for space cooperation. Well, uh, I think that our, our time is up, uh, more or less. Uh, so I'd like you to, to thank our, our, our guest, uh, Joseph Ashbarer, for, for his time. And uh, I'll say, uh, see you next year, next same place, same questions. <laughs> I hope I see you before, but uh, certainly in this format, I'm very happy to be back here again. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>